Hey, Dr. C here with you, and I want to talk about your protein needs. Let's make sense about protein in terms of to keep you from being deficient in it, but also how much is going to work best for your overall health and how it ties into these goals. So the first thing to think about is protein deficiency. And many argue that you cannot get protein deficiency, and totally agree. It's pretty tough to do unless you're sadly in a state of just overt starvation and malnutrition. Let's compare this to scurvy for a moment. So scurvy was the blight of sailors who would spend months at a time without access to produce. And they learned that, you know, the British sailors became called limeys because they learned that limes could prevent that. So it's true, you can offset scurvy with a pretty meager amount of limes. But back to the protein argument, many make it out that because it's easy to avoid protein deficiency, that it's bad to eat protein above the amount that you need to prevent the deficiency. You should stop right at that threshold, like not one more speck. <laughs> well, that's silly with scurvy, right? You would never say, oh, you could prevent scurvy by eating the juice from a lime twice a month. So you should not eat more produce than that. That's the maximum amount of produce you should ever want to consume. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> we know very well that in the case of vitamin C and produce in general, the amount that would prevent you from getting scurvy is valid, but there's a lot of benefit at levels that are higher than that. So just because there's some threshold of deficiency doesn't mean that's the best for all circumstances or all definitions of health. I want to talk about a condition called sarcopenia, and this is just loss of muscle mass. And we don't hear it mentioned a lot, but it's a huge determinant of the quality of our lifespan. Somewhere starting around age 40 for both genders, we lose about 8-9% of our muscle mass every decade of life. So almost 1% per year. And let's think that through. If that's starting at 40, by the time you're 80, you've lost, what, 40% of your muscle mass? So what does that do? Well, it lowers your basal metabolic rate. It creates disease earlier in life with more consequence. Uh, it leads to increased fat mass. And it's caused by a lot of factors, not all of which we understand, but we know that as we age, we have fewer muscle satellite cells. So these aren't cells that are connecting to satellites. That'd be cool, I guess, but they're cells that can regenerate damaged muscle tissue. So we can't repair muscle damage as well. Our hormones change, and our, our stress hormones, our androgenic hormones, they differ throughout age. We may have more chronic inflammation, perhaps more oxidative stress, and there's also this anabolic resistance. So the same protein amounts that we could consume, we don't use as well with age. And the older our age, the worse this is. This is tougher for women than men. It completely affects both genders, but women get a, a much more intense amount of sarcopenia in the same circumstances. And then also just immobility. And at the extreme, that can be laid up post-surgery, but that can also just be living like a modern human, <laughs> you know, that kind of immobility. But it's a big deal. So in terms of just like early mortality risk, having some sarcopenia takes your risk four times higher than it would be otherwise. And then even short of mortality, we think about disability. You know, can you take care of yourself? If you've got sarcopenia, you've got three times the risk of having disability. Falls, fractures are easier. Pneumonia, cognitive impairment. Your brain can't work without your muscles. Your blood pressure can't regulate as well. So where do we draw the line in the sand? Where do we say that person B has sarcopenia, but person C does not? And person D is close, person E is nowhere close. How do we quantify all that? You know, there's a lot of conflicting guidelines and many of them are based upon uh, DEXA evaluation of the body and the muscle mass. And there's some different cutoffs that talk about that, but they're, they're not consistent. One of the easiest tools that's been pretty well recognized is grip strength. So men, that number is about 57 pounds. Women, it's about 35 pounds. Now, there are dynamometers, there are machines that many doctors have, or a lot of physical therapists have, uh, chiropractors often have these. They can measure your grip strength. They can give you an exact number. You grip on it hard and it shows you a number. There's also a lot of grippers that you can find online or at sporting goods stores. Some of the better ones will tell you how much force it takes to grip them. I would highly encourage you, they're a great exercise anyway, 
And there's a lot of data about grip strength being important for many facets of your health. I would grab a gripper. If you want to go into it, you can buy a dynamometer. They're not all that expensive, but you can buy grippers for $10 to $30, a dynamometer for $50, $70, and you can easily track and also train and improve your grip strength. So I challenge you to be aware of that. Again, guys, 57 pounds, that's our cutoff, and women, 35 pounds. You know, quick aside, um, my son and I are climbers, and there's nothing more satisfying than being able to open jars for people. <laughs> so guys love to be able to open jars and you know be the hero of the day when the jar is stuck closed. But you want a good grip strength for a million reasons, and that's just, just one of many. <laughs> um, so this sarcopenia, this muscle loss, so how do we control that? Well, one of the biggest drivers is our protein intake. And let me just tell you quickly that if you're at that threshold where you're like two steps above your protein deficiency, if you're having that, you know, two limes per month, you're not going to make it. You're going to lose muscle mass. The amount that keep you from getting diseases like quashiorcor or protein calorie malnutrition, those levels do not prevent sarcopenia. Those do not prevent age-related muscle loss. So protein matters, your exercise matters. But here's the thing, exercise without protein won't help. Protein with a little bit of exercise can help. So both are important. But this is a thing to where it's just a lot like bone loss to where it's easier to prevent it than it is to treat it. It's also a lot like bone loss in that a lot of this, this loss starts and happens early in life, even early adulthood but the consequences are often a bit later on. So it's the same that way. So let's put some thoughts into protein and how much we really want and need. And one big thought is you've got to consider how much protein you consume and how much protein you consume compared to your fats and carbs. You know, your protein to fuel ratio is what I call that. So we can't ignore the second part. If you get enough protein, but you get a ton of extra fats and carbs along the way, you're gonna gain so much fat mass that the muscle mass is not as helpful because it's your body composition that ultimately matters the most. And this is important for all of us, but there's a lot of data saying that the elderly may be getting very few foods that are high quality dense protein. This also can be a risk for vegans and vegetarians. Now, they're really not at risk for protein deficiency. And there's been a lot of good advocates in that space, in the plant-based space, who have talked about protein deficiency being a non-issue. They're totally right. It's a non-issue. You can easily get enough to not be deficient, the same way that those two limes per month can keep you from getting scurvy. Uh, but we're talking now about preventing sarcopenia, not protein deficiency. And you can get adequate grams of quality protein without much thought on plant-based diets. However, to get adequate grams, it often does take a lot of food. So in the case of beans, for example, I love beans. They're one of the best foods there are, but they're one part of protein to five part of carbohydrate. But we can say the same thing about nuts and seeds, you know, about one part of protein to five parts of fat. So beans are good carbs, nuts and seeds are good fats for sure, but how much works best, especially if you're thinking about a higher target of protein grams. That's where it does take some dense sources, which you can also find on vegan and vegetarian diets. There's fewer choices, but there are choices. They, they do exist. Now, protein timing also matters. You know, I'm sorry, one more quick point on vegans and vegetarians. There is a subcategory that's called themselves Ostra Vegan. Not ostrich, Ostra Vegan. And many have chosen to become plant-based because for a lot of great reasons. You know, they want to Think about the humanitarian treatment of animals. There's the ethical considerations of that. There's the environmental impact of that. And of course, the nutritional things. Well, many vegans have thought all those factors through and thought, wow, um, none of that applies to shellfish. That shellfish, if they're raised and farmed, they have the same life. If they could have an experience, they don't have any central nervous system. They've got a few clustered nerves. They can, you know, if you poke them, they will close. But so does a Venus flytrap. I mean, plants can do that too. Plants have that same level of neurologic response. So do they experience anything different? I mean, they sit, they filter. If they're farmed, they sit, they filter. They can have a normal lifespan. They help the environment. You know, there's not the negative sides of that. So there are some who have looked at this issue and said, you know, my real concern is not so much just following a rule, 
there's a reason behind that. And the reason is I don't want to harm creatures. And I don't want to worsen the environment. And they've decided that, hey, I can meet those goals and add shellfish to my diet. And in doing so, wow, the quality of protein that you get and the B12, the iron, the zinc, the omega-3 fats, it's like the perfect nutrient for someone who's on a plant-based diet. So just throwing that out there, if the real goal is to minimize harm and lower environmental problems, some people have said, wow, shellfish passed that rule. Few would say that eating cows would pass those rules. But many have said, hey, shellfish can pass that rule. Okay, back to our program. <laughs> so another thought about protein is the timing of it. So there's how much we get, but there's also the timing. And it seems that your first serving of protein is a big determinant of the health of your muscle mass. So the longer the gaps are without quality protein, the more we're tapping into our muscles to supply protein for chemical reactions. And our nighttime is the longest time that we don't eat anything. So your first meal being prompt upon waking and containing about a quarter to a third of your day's protein intake seems to be a big game changer. This comes up from a lot of directions and a lot of research. So having your first meal about an hour from waking up, for most people that's around 20, 30 grams of quality protein, but this can completely shift your whole day's energy and blood sugar. Now, throughout the rest of the day, the same sorts of things apply. You don't want gaps of much more than four hours without consuming some quality protein. And it probably is not an issue. You, you, you can't absorb a lot at once. Some have said you can't absorb more than 30 grams at once. That's probably not true. But because it benefits to have it on a frequent basis, there, you wouldn't want to have a whole lot at once. Because either you're going to have to overeat or you're going to miss some later on. So it's the kind of thing that you want spread out rather evenly throughout the day, not because you can absorb it, but just because that works better for keeping it in your muscle mass. Now, isn't too much protein bad? Well, this is a question I hear a lot, and it's kind of funny because um, too much, by definition, is bad. <laughs> you know, too much of anything, too much means there's more than there should, there's too much. That's just a bad thing. So inherently, yes it is, but is too much protein a risk that we would, a category we could fall into by consuming it at levels of intake that I'm describing here. Well, this has been studied pretty well. And if you're talking about supplements and dietary intake, even like, like 40, 50% of your caloric intake, which is a lot, you would have to be doing a very unusual diet to get that much protein. Is that a bad thing? Is that harmful? Well, this is talked about in terms of kidney function. Do you damage your kidneys? Well, this has been thoroughly studied. We've got to differentiate people that have kidney damage from those who do not. If you have kidney damage, there is some strong debate whether or not a high protein intake worsens that. What happens when you consume more protein, your kidneys are filtering more protein. It doesn't mean you're harming them, they're just doing more filtering of protein. And that may be bad for those that have kidney damage, but the data is completely clear that will not cause someone to get kidney damage. If your kidneys are healthy, you may have higher levels of creatinine from a higher protein diet, but that's not harming your kidneys. There's no damage occurring from that. The other thought is about, does this affect lifespan? Does this cause people to die early or have chronic disease? And there are mouse models suggestive of it, but mice work very differently than men do in terms of how protein affects blood sugar, in terms of their basal metabolic rate, and also in terms of markers like their mTOR function. So it's possible that mice consuming less protein may extend their possible lifespan. But it's also possible that mice just consuming less food total expend their possible lifespan. We've got to differentiate um, theory and, and results and then health span and lifespan. So lifespan is, for humans, probably maybe 120. There's not many good examples of humans living past that. Health span is, do we make it to as long as our genes would let us live for, or do we die early? So there's health span and lifespan. And then there's theory and there's observation. You know, what do, what do we think might happen and what have we actually seen happen? So based upon my studies, some think that humans could extend their lifespan by consuming less protein. It's not convincing. Mice are quite different, and this has not been shown to be occurring in humans at all. Now, based upon observation, there's large amounts of observational data saying that humans that avoid sarcopenia do better with their health span. They're less apt to die early. 
and that's based on large amounts of actual human evidence. So much, much more relevant. The other thought that comes up is about whether protein causes osteoporosis, whether it causes bone thinning. And this has also been really well studied. And the consensus is that those that have higher dietary protein intakes have better bone health and have less risks for osteoporosis. There's so much overlap between sarcopenia and bone growth, osteoporosis. It's pretty fascinating stuff how similar they are. Then the other big topic we'll hear about is cancer. Does eating protein cause cancer? And we've got epidemiologic evidence, and this is a quote from one of the last large review studies. They stated that the literature on protein is much more limited than the literature concerning fats in cancer. Because of the high correlation between fat and protein intake in Western diets and the more consistent and often stronger association of these cancers with fat intake, it seems more likely that dietary fat is the more active component. So if you're looking at someone consuming fatty meats, for example, there may be a slight increase in some cancers, but there's not data saying that it was the protein that did that. More so, the fat was the culprit, if anything was, as opposed to just like a total food intake. Because that's always relevant if you're not talking about protein relative to fuel. High protein is often in the context of just like a high fuel diet, just overeating. And that by itself is harmful. But it wasn't the protein part per se, it was the overeating part that was the harmful part. Then we think about experimental evidence. So to date, here's another quote from one of the last big review studies. In some laboratory experiments, carcinogenesis or cancer growth was suppressed by diets containing levels of protein at or below minimum required levels for optimum growth. But just to pull out for a second, these were fasting, starvation type diets. And you may lower cancer growth temporarily, but you're in a fasting or starvation state. It wasn't inherently that protein was the culprit. So, however, when they looked at, uh, there's been other studies showing that higher levels of protein begin to inhibit carcinogenesis in these same, the same types of studies. So there's a sweet spot, and more may stop cancer growth the same way that starvation can. So you can be on a higher protein healthy diet and not be starving and get the same benefits. Starving can help some things, but it doesn't help everything, obviously. So you don't cause cancer by eating protein in these reasonable ranges. So thinking about optimal amounts that would improve body composition, what would that really look like? Let's run some math here. Let's say this is for a woman who's 133 pounds, say she's 25% body fat. So her lean body mass will be 100 pounds. So the body fat is 25, so the lean mass is 75%. That's gonna put her at about 100 pounds of lean body mass total. And in those cases, um, her dietary protein should be about that target, somewhere around 100 grams. And in a typical day, that would look like what? A morning protein shake, about 25 grams there. Lunch could be a tempeh uh, lettuce tomato sandwich, you know, the TLT. <laughs> and you can get 30 grams of protein out of that one, do some sprouted bread on that. Dinner, do some salmon, do some white beans, have some greens with that. You can do another 30 grams right there. And a snack at some point, you could do some fermented cottage cheese and fruit. So this day's total was 100 grams. And no unusual weird foods, pretty easy stuff to work in. And plus we got that morning serving too. So that's a general idea. And you can easily avoid protein deficiency, but optimal protein to offset sarcopenia and premature aging and improved body composition takes a little more thought and planning. Dr. C, we're here with you. Take great care. We'll talk in real soon. Bye-bye.